and our minds, providing us with new perspectives and new wonders. Tonight on Greater Boston, light at the end of the pandemic tunnel got a lot brighter today with word of a second vaccine proving itself highly effective against COVID-19. But will the good news cause us to act more or less responsibly in the cold, dark months as we wait? A national COVID researcher and top doctor joined me on those issues ahead. Then later, when his conviction was overturned in the murder of a Boston police detective and prosecutors dropped the charges, Sean Ellis gained his freedom but lost the chance to prove his innocence in court after 22 years in prison. So Ellis is making his case instead in a new Netflix docu-series called Trial 4. He joins me along with his lawyer and the film's director. Two weeks in a row of blockbuster Monday morning pandemic announcements are raising hopes that the end of all this might really be within reach. This morning, we learned Moderna has become the second company with the vaccine proving itself to be more than 90 percent effective in preventing COVID-19 infections. The Moderna vaccine, in fact, is 94.5 percent effective, according to the independent panel monitoring their early data, meaning vaccinations for the highest risk groups could start by the end of the year. Like Pfizer's vaccine, Moderna's would require two doses, given several weeks apart. But one big advantage Moderna has over Pfizer is that its vaccine does not need to be kept nearly as cold and can stay refrigerated six times longer, up to 30 days. But although celebration is certainly warranted, we're far from out of the woods just yet. There are plenty of questions remaining about the logistics of getting vaccines to everyone, not to mention how long protection might last. And there's still many months to go until we see widespread vaccination. As a reminder, we passed the 11 million COVID case mark nationwide yesterday. And while it took us more than three months to see the first million confirmed cases, it took us less than a week to see the latest million. Here in Massachusetts, we're averaging more than 2,400 new cases a day. Some are predicting we're on a path towards seeing over 10,000 cases a day in the near future as people around the state are increasingly engaging in riskier behaviors. I'm joined now by one man who's raising those alarms, David Lazar. He's a Northeastern University professor and researcher with the COVID-19 Consortium for Understanding the Public's Policy Preferences Across States. Dr. Catherine Gergen Barnett is the Vice Chair of Primary Care Innovation and Transformation and Program Director of the Department of Family Medicine at Boston Medical Center. Good to see you both. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for Thank having you. us. David, can I start with you? You identified behaviors or activities that have been on the rise at the exact same time that infection numbers have been on, on the rise. You compared April with October. Could you describe a few of those behaviors, if you would? Sure. Uh, we were looking, we asked people about um, how much they were in rooms with other people outside of their household, um, because that's a, a setting where a disease might spread, uh, going to restaurants, um, uh, going to gyms, um, being in groups more generally. And we saw all of those numbers go up 50 percent, 100 percent from what they were early in the spring. Of course, in the spring, we were uh, we were all shell shocked uh, by how awful it was in Massachusetts. Uh, but it has it has gone up dramatically. And as our behaviors have changed, uh, how so have the uh, case rates. If we can just put those numbers up on the screen, have you been to a restaurant, threefold increase, seen someone indoors outside your household uh, doubled, and been to the gym from less than 1% to 7%? There's one piece, I guess, of good news. Mask wearing is on the increase in Massachusetts. Is that correct? That's right. Uh, Massachusetts uh, actually was very early on uh, relative to the rest of the country in terms of wearing masks. And we have among the highest... Uh, reported levels of uh, mass compliance in the country. So uh, we, about a week ago, the governor announced uh, 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 some tightening of restrictions, Cur curfews, earlier restaurant closings, smaller indoor gatherings. Based upon your research, did the governor go far enough? Well, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, the question one has to have is, um, is whether it really curbs the core behaviors that are driving the increase. Uh, if you have curfews for restaurants, 
uh, if people, the same number of people go to the restaurant in fewer hours, that will make things worse. Uh, mask wearing mandate is great, but actually mask wearing is pretty good in Massachusetts. And the one place that you can't really enforce mask wearing is indoors where it's most uh, most important. So I'm, a, I'm, I'm worried that we're not hitting the brakes hard enough right now. So what brakes should he be hitting that he's not hitting, David? You know, all I can say uh, is, you know, looking at the data is that, you know, is that we need to do more to prevent people from gathering in spaces together, right? That's the key thing that's driving the spread of the disease. Um, and, um, you know, it's not, it's not for me necessarily to say exactly what are the interventions to do that, uh, but, uh, but I, I feel like um, I think more, unfortunately, has to be done. So let's see if uh, the doctor feels it's her business to talk about more interventions. Should the uh, state, should the governor be doing more? And if so, what? Look, I, I totally agree with David, and I really appreciate the um, research and literature that you're showing in terms of you know, social um, behaviors are changing. We're seeing it um, outside. We're seeing it in restaurants. We're seeing it in gyms. And the fact is, is uh, everyone is very cognizant that governors um, don't want to go back down to a lockdown. We obviously know that's not what we want to happen in the country. Uh, we've heard that from Biden's transition team. Uh, but we have to be really thoughtful about, you know, what what's the bulldozer approach versus what's the sort of scalpel approach. Um, curfews, what is the scalpel approach? Yeah, what is the scalpel approach? So, look, I think the is we know that things like uh, perhaps curfews may not be enough. Um, you know, the fact is, is that people may be going inside to then gather um, in private homes, and that's when our case rate is going to be driven up, similar to what we saw um, David's literature showing um, in, in terms of social behaviors and people being more likely to gather inside. We also know that we don't want a breakdown and, and a shutdown of our economy. Um, and I think that Biden's transition team is being really clear about wanting to avoid that. Um, I think we, as our governor, is being really clear. Um, and But the fact is, is if we don't have a stimulus plan, we can't shut down. So we need to think about a middle road in terms of what are the most unsafe behaviors. And we know that Gathering inside and eating inside, as David suggested, are among the most unsafe. Uh, and frankly, that's when we have our masks off and our guard down. Okay, that means Zoom Thanksgiving, I think it means to say safe. Can we talk, uh, leave the tunnel and go to the light for a couple of seconds, uh, yeah. doctor? I know there hasn't been all of the review that there would be. This is a press release. There's been some review. Uh, are you as confident about the results out of Moderna as even out Anthony Fauci appears to be? Yeah, look, I agree. There is such light at the end of the tunnel. I think I'm I'm very optimistic. I joined the leagues of optimism uh, on some of the recent results that have come out from Pfizer last week and Moderna today. Um, we do not expect vaccine to have such high efficacy rates. We usually mm -hmm. Fact, you know, anywhere from 50 to 70 percent is um, hopeful. And the fact that we're looking at 90 to 95 percent um, is very hopeful. That being said, there's a difference between efficacy and effectiveness. So what we're seeing now is in a trial. It's young, healthy people. We don't know how this vaccine will work once it gets out into the general population, once it works on people with lots of other chronic conditions. Um, I know that both Pfizer and Moderna have done a good job in recruiting a pretty diverse um, group of individuals, uh, but I think there's still a lot to be seen. You know, I want to ask you both, uh, starting with you, David, if, uh, if I can. I know you're, neither of you are shrinks, but when I woke up this morning and I heard this news, my immediate reaction, speaking for myself, was it's going to be a lot easier for me to get through a Thanksgiving, for example, without our kids here, knowing that in the not-too-distant future uh, there will be a vaccine. A number of people I spoke to today, including on the radio, had the exact opposite concern that we would begin to act respons irresponsibly uh, because we see this proverbial light. What do you think about that, David Lazar? Well, I think it highlights all the more reason why we should act aggressively now, because it really is a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, who wants to be the last person to be infected with COVID-19? Yeah. Um, 
how how we're going to react, uh, it's hard to say. I think that I'm hoping that people will uh, be hearing about the increases in cases and the increases in risks and uh, and be more careful and have uh, less family or not have uh, family over for Thanksgiving and so on, because otherwise these, these holidays could act as a real accelerant uh, for the disease. Dr. Gergen, Barnett, you see patients, and I, I know that it, I'm sure you see it because I see it. There is pandemic fatigue. It's an overused expression. But do you worry about the an irresponsible reaction to two Mondays in a row of good vaccine news? Um, yes and no. I think, you know, a lot of people may have shared your sense of, you know, I can get through this and, and perhaps mm -hmm. I can actually kind of buckle down and do my part. And maybe it won't be so important for me to go to that extra party if I know that in a couple of months, um, high risk folks can start getting the vaccine. Atul Gwande, I thought, used a really nice analogy last week in a conversation where he really said, you know, we now have light at the end of the tunnel. Let's see how we can get everybody through that tunnel safely uh, to get to that place. And, and I, you know, I think the more we can communicate that um, and, and simultaneously, the more we're working on in, uh, really, you know, making sure that people are trusting the vaccine um, and creating conversations around that, especially, um, you know, I work at Boston Medical Center. I think there's a lot of work we need to be doing in communities around trusting vaccines. And, and I think that's the work we need to do alongside this good news so that we can truly get to the good news. Well, we only have a minute left, but since you brought that up, let me put something up, a survey from Stat News of the Globe in the Harris Poll. Uh, the U.S. population as a whole from mid-August to mid-October, people planning to get the vaccine as soon as it's available, down 10 points. White Americans down 10 points. Black Americans down 20 points. Very quickly, starting with you, doctor, what turns that around? I mean, a lot of people hope a president who is not homicidal in his reaction to the virus is a good first step. What is the what is the solution? Quickly. Well, I, I agree that is a good first step. I think we need to have leaders in the community who are from the community, uh, yeah. really showing showing leadership around it. You know, there's a great picture of Elvis Presley getting the polio vaccine, and that really turned it around for the polio vaccine. So, how do we get leaders from each community kind of showing that they trust it and sharing their stories? David, you study behaviors. What? How do we change that behavior quickly, if you can? Sure. Uh, we've been uh, do also surveying um, the uh, willingness to take vaccines. We've also observed a, a downward motion. Uh, I, I agree with the recommendation that we get people embedded uh, in the communities who are trusted. You know, you have to trust uh, when the institutions, when you're going to be injected with something, right? And I think part of the reason why we see low levels of trust among African Americans is because of both contemporary and History. historical uh, issues there. And then the other group that's very uh, skeptical are conservative uh, Americans. Uh, uh, Trump supporters are actually very skeptical, even though Trump ha has been touting uh, the vaccine as, uh, mm. as something that will save us. Uh, so our partisan breakdowns, our partisan polarization is also a big obstacle. Uh, David Lazar, thanks so much. Dr. Catherine Gergen Burnett, to you as well. Appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you, you so much. We brought you the story of Sean Ellis a few times over the years. Now he's at the center of a new Netflix docu-series called Trial 4, the story of Ellis's quest to prove what he's maintained for more than a quarter century, 22 of those years in jail, that he did not murder a Boston police detective. For my fourth trial, I want to be vindicated. I want to be exonerated. But I won't be the only one that's on trial. The Boston police will be on trial. I want the jury to have the opportunity to hear everything that went on in the case. Everything. I definitely want the world to know that, that I'm innocent. But that opportunity never came. Now, for those who don't know the case, investigators said Detective John Mulligan was on detail and sleeping in his car in front of a Walgreens in Roslindale when he was shot five times in the face and killed following a robbery back in 93. Ellis, then 19 years old, was quickly arrested and tried for Mulligan's murder. The first two trials ended in hung juries, although one jury did convict Ellis of weapons possession. Then at a third trial, he was convicted of murder and first-degree robbery and sentenced to life without parole. 
But later, two Boston police detectives, pivotal to the case against Ellis, Walter Robinson and Kenneth Acera, pled guilty to corruption charges. And a third corrupt cop got immunity in exchange for testifying against the others, casting new doubt on witness testimony and physical evidence they'd found. In 2015, his murder conviction was overturned. Ellis was released on bail on a fourth trial ordered. But then in 2018, prosecutors dropped the charges. And while that made Sean Ellis a free man, it also meant he never did get that fourth trial and his chance to prove his innocence in court. So he's taken his case directly to the public instead via Netflix, where he and his lawyers lay out what happened in 93 and everything they've learned since, along with witnesses, jurors, police officers, journalists, including some clips from this show and others at GBH. I'm joined now by Sean Ellis, his lawyer, Rosemary Scapiccio, and the series director, Remy Burkell. Uh, welcome to all three of you. Congratulations. It's a really powerful mm -hmm. film. Thank you. Thank you. Sean, why'd you agree to be the subject of an eight hour documentary? That's an amazing question. It's, it's, <laughs> there's, a, there's a problem um, in this country. And uh, when, when I think about what is going on with black and brown people um, within this criminal justice system, with mass incarceration, police brutality, um, things of that nature. It's, 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 there needed to be something that, that shed light on the injustices mm -hmm. that, that are faced by us as a people. And so um, that, was, that was really at the heart of, of that decision because mm -hmm. it isn't about Sean Ellis. It's about, it's, it's about those who are who are continuously being uh, victimized by, mm -hmm. by, uh, by the criminal justice system? Remy, what drew you to Sean's story? Um, well, first of all, we just want to know that we're we're a whole team. I mean, there was several people who were drawn to Sean's story. Allison Luchak and Ben Travers, amongst others, were the were the um, were the producers mm -hmm. who came on. This you found the story originally. It's, it's a story that had just so many incredible storytelling elements. I mean, Sean's story, the Boston police story, the corruption, um, things we've learned through Rosemary as well about how, you know, how all this was hidden, how documents were hidden from the prosecution for so long. And so you look at the story and you just look at this. Also, you look at this young 19 year old man who was accused of this horrendous murder. I mean, the murder itself is horrendous. It was an execution yeah. style murder five bullets in the face and the fact that this young man was accused just be, it went after he went to the police spontaneously and said, I was just there buying diapers and he could have been a witness. And suddenly he becomes, you know, the perfect, the perfect um, usual suspect. So all those elements said, wow, this is just a very strong story. So uh, Rosemary, I see that Sean jumped into it. Obviously, uh, uh, Remy did too. I assume the one with the reservations was the lawyer. Am I right? Or did were you that's totally that's into this too? Right. As I a figured. criminal defense attorney, I didn't want anyone following Sean or having any access to him, uh, especially without me being there. But, uh, you know, Sean and I had a long conversation and, and he thought that it was important to tell this story. And, and I thought it was important to, um, you know, to, to make sure that the next jury that was going to hear this case uh, was going to hear it in a way that they would have the full picture uh, in terms of what was happening. And, and we fought really hard to get the documents that we got so that we would be ready for a full trial before Pappas dismissed the case. So, uh, it, Sean, did you see this documentary as the fourth trial you never had, an opportunity to prove your innocence? Because as Rosemary just mentioned, acting DA Pappas, when they dropped the charges, both he at the time and uh, the current police commissioner, and the police commissioner then, Gross, went out of their way to say they were absolutely not saying that you were innocent. In fact, they were saying the contrary. So was this essentially your fourth trial? Well, I, I can't take credit for like for that concept. Um, but it's, it's, it's just really a documentation of my life in part in, in the injustice that was, that, that was faced and what has came about um, is what essentially has turned out to be a fourth trial. Yeah. You know, uh, Remy, a lot of people at the end of uh, the episodes, there, you have a list of people who were intimately involved in this, many of them on the wrong side, who refused to talk to you. 
what is that mess? What message is conveyed by that? What were you trying to say? Well, it, it's a, it was basically to say that we did it. You know, we did it. We did it. Was teamwork, as I said. It's a journalistic work. We went and looked and talked to everybody. I mean, the list goes on. I mean, we have. You know, I could go on to Ralph Martin, Mel King, Mayor Flynn from the time to get. You know, Ted Landsmark. We talked. We did our. We did our due diligence, uh -huh. as you would say in the law, but. We just looked at everything, and we looked at every document we get our hands on. And like in the stories, you know, Rosemary took 10 years to get documents through FOIAs. We took over a year to get some of the documents we wanted to look at, too. So even if we're not, you know, a lawyer, no one's in, no one's in, in, you know, in prison because of us. But we, we talked to a lot of people, and people, certain people said, yeah, we're going to go on camera. We'll accept that. And a lot of people said yes and then disappeared. And other people just said, no way, not in Boston. I'm not going to go on camera. Those police officers are still out there. We're still afraid of blowback it, 25 years later. So it's, it's, it tells you a lot about the story. <clears throat> what did it tell you, uh, Rosemary? You know all the players. I'm sure those names carried a lot of meaning for you, the, the people who refused to cooperate. What did it say to you? It told me that the people who refused to cooperate had... had um, something to hide. And, and, you know, we're still in a position now where we're trying to get Sean's uh, gun conviction uh, reversed as well so that he is no longer a convicted felon. And uh, right now we're in negotiations with uh, the district attorney's office to try to pick up where we left off in terms of talking about this case. And I can tell you that uh, when she first took office, Rachel Rollins, and I had a conversation uh, about Sean's case. And at that time, uh, her priority in her office was actually uh, people who were currently incarcerated fighting to get out, yeah. uh, like the, the uh, Keon Sprinkles and the Ronnie Qualls of the world that she was working mm. on. Uh, but but I expect that we're going to continue to talk about trying to get rid of Sean Ellis's gun conviction because he, he, he didn't do it and he shouldn't be a convicted felon because of, of, of this case. You know, uh, I had her uh, on the radio uh, with me just the other day. And I had her on immediately after she was elected. She said she was going to look into a whole bunch of cases. I said, did that include Sean Ellis's? She said it might. What she said to me is the other day is, I'm not going to say that, Jim, when I said, what are you doing about this case? I'm just telling you that this will not be the last time you hear my voice on this issue. We're looking at everything that has happened here. It, it does, when she said that, and she wouldn't tell me what specifically, is it around the gun charges or what exactly... That, that's it, my focus. Or is I mean, it broader? I would, I, I would love to see Sean exonerated. That would be a dream come true to him and to me. Could she do that? Uh, could she, she could, do that? Absolutely, she could. Uh, but but uh, the why first are you step, not pushing her to do that? From underneath the gun conviction, and and that's you know that's what we're working on now. And like I said, we we had talked initially when she took office, um, and she was busy working on other cases where people were still in jail uh, for having not committed a crime, and that was her focus. And, and now I, I I think that she's more focused on what's happening with Sean, the injustice in the system, and the way that her office was portrayed uh, in, in trial four was horrific. I mean, because it was true. So do you have hope, so Rosemary, do you have hope that she could ultimately declare exoneration for Sean? I, I think she could. I don't know if she will, but I think she could uh, based on, on all of the evidence that's been developed in this case. And to give Sean the opportunity to not be a convicted felon, go and live the rest of his life um, a, 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 as the person that he is. And not drag that that ball and chain around with him um, on this gun conviction that that we all know. You either believe he did it or you didn't, and, and there is no yeah. in between. There's no gray area here at all. Do you know who did it, Rosemary? I do not, but I know no one's you looking for them, so that's yeah. a problem. Sean, Sean, I know you're sick of me asking this question. Every time you're here, I ask you the same question because I can't believe your answer, which is you spent 22 years of your life in jail for something that you say relentlessly you did not do. I always ask you, why are you not, even your mother in the film says he's not angry. Why are you not angry that half of your life was taken away for something you say you didn't do? So allow me to explain this. Like, it's, it's not that I'm angry, it's not that I'm not angry, Jim. It's, it's, it's when I watch the documentary, it's, it's like there's feelings inside of me that arise. But what I'm saying is, what does it do to serve, like how would it serve me to walk around angry and bitter and just weighed down? Like, like that isn't who I am as a person. And so like 
to do that, then what? You're a better person than me, Sean Ellis, but I guess that's pretty obvious. <laughs> so, hey, Remy, what so, do you, what do you so, want the viewer to take? I'm sorry. Go ahead, Sean. So, uh, Jim, like, let me let me say this. If, when you walk around, like, when you're upset, can you envision yourself walking around feeling that way for the rest of your life? Like that's a that's a heavy reality to walk around with, yeah. and 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 like I'm I'm making a conscious des- decision to try to work on and heal myself from the inside out. I, I, it comes through, Sean. Quickly, Remy, we're short on time. What do you want people to take away from these eight hours? Um, I would like them to take away the you know what, what Sean is talking about and what Rosemary is talking about that they're you know people can change, people can they're you know you. you through their votes, they can actually change. They can vote in a new DA who's going to be progressive. They can vote in a new president. Um, and I want them to, you know, this is the, this is this is Sean and Rosemary's. I'm a conduit through which we're going to tell a story of injustice, yeah. poli- uh, you know, systemic racism, and a system that just didn't work for this man. And that's that's what I want them to take. And this is Sean and uh, Rosemary's story. It's I, I just well, want them to you. really live that story. Yeah, and, emotion, and emotionally live it because it's an emotional story. I was watching episode eight with my family just a little while ago in France, and I'm still in tears. It's just when they, when they, when they, you know, when when Bappas yeah. and Gross got up there and said what they said at that dismissal, I just go, I had to go to tears. I mean, it's a great moment. Sean's free, but he's not exonerated, and that's just so damn unfair. It's really unfair, and I want well, people Remy- to get and people are getting it. That's it. You know, and and Sean said he's doing it for people beyond himself. Your timing could not be better. Sean, I only have 30 seconds. Can we end on an up note here? Uh, Tell people what you're doing, if that's okay with you. You're working for a wonderful organization. Yeah, so I am am part of the development team uh, at Community Servings. Uh, Community community Servings uh, essentially is a nonprofit organization that provides um, medically tailored meals for the sick and infirmed. Um, and so I, sh- I shouldn't be saying too much, uh, with, without, okay. you know, authorization, but, um, it's a great organization. Um, uh, right now we're actually in a, uh, major drive called Pine uh, Sky. And so you can go on our website at communityservants.org and, uh, you know, purchase a pie, a pie for a client and you can select me as, as, as the seller. Hey, Sean, I ordered two pies while I'm watching the film yesterday, so I'm all uh, covered. And by the way, Sean just got a promotion. He's too humble to say it. Rosemary Scapiccio, uh, Remy Burkell, and Sean Ellis, thank you. And I urge everybody to watch every minute of those eight hours. Thanks to all three for being here. Thanks thank you, much. Jim. Thank you, for WGBH. Thank you very much. The series, again, is Trial 4, and you can see it on Netflix right now. That's it for tonight. We'll be back tomorrow with a full show dedicated to some of those hardest hit by this pandemic, COVID-19 survivors, some of lost people they loved, service industry workers, and small business owners. That and more tomorrow at 7. Thanks for watching. Please stay safe. successful as primates are, they are not invincible in our modern world.